Hello and welcome friends to the Sustainable Development E-Talk series, which is co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management, Indore. And our speaker for today is noted climate justice activist. Oh, she has a very big name, like her stature, Maria Teresa Tetet Nera Lauren. But we lovingly call her Tetet only. Is that right, Tetet? I can call you Tetet? Of course, uh, I am yeah. Tetet to all friends. Yes, yes. So Tetet is associated with Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and Center for International Dialogue and Cooperation Advisor for United Nations Program International Politics Unit. From my personal experience, I can say that Tetet has a way to keep the audience simply spellbound. So without much ado, over to you, Tetet, to share your insights why we cannot have sustainable development without climate justice, which is so much, so very much ingrained in it and important for it. This e-talk comes at a very appropriate time in the sense that day after tomorrow, we have the Earth Day. So we are celebrating Earth Day and the whole idea is to save our planet Earth and have sustainable development. Over to you, Tete. Thank you very much, uh, Shoba, for your very generous introduction. I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> You've built me up so much. <laughs> and um, thank you to everyone for um, joining this e-talk this afternoon. It's uh, These are very weird times no, for everybody. Uh, but as I always would like to... Think, think about it, you know, for us, this is a mind, this is a disruption, but for many more in this planet, this is devastation. You know? So I think it helps to put things in proper context. And, uh, you know, just as a reminder that, um, yeah, we need to be kinder to each other, but always try to, you know, hold others accountable for the larger mess that we're in. So before we start, um, I'd like to share with you um, this set of slides that I've prepared. I would have wanted to... Um, make it more engaging because as Shoba built me up, you know, there's so much pressure. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, <laughs> no, but uh, okay. So um, perhaps we can start by uh, showing you this first slide, which is about climate justice and sustainable development. Some important lessons in global solidarity that we all learned in kindergarten. Yeah. But before we start, some house rules. So I'm now your uh, quote unquote teacher this afternoon. So I would really appreciate it that we try to remove the distractions. Um, get yourself a drink if you could. Uh, if you're interested to take down notes, that would be so much better also. But most importantly, um, I hope we all try to center ourselves no? because now is the time to really um, Take good care, not just of ourselves, but of the others as well. All right? Yes. And before we begin, uh, please take five deep breaths. No, So I'm not your yoga instructress, but uh, <laughs> let's try. Okay, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So... What does uh, this afternoon's talk would uh, involve? Uh, things we learned about in kindergarten. Now we'll try to simplify it, but really the lessons are just so huge and immense that uh, we might get overwhelmed. So the first thing that I want to share with you is that climate change is not science fiction. What does science tell us? So you have the graph uh, in front of you that tells us that 2017 was the third hottest year on record. The year before that, 2016 was the hottest and 2015 the second. 17 of the 18 hottest years on record have occurred this century alone. And the planet has warmed so much above pre-industrial levels and continues to warm at the rate of 0 0.2 degrees centigrade, centigrade per decade. The last time there was this much carbon in the atmosphere was 3 million years ago. 
and the last time global average temperatures were 2 degrees centigrade warmer, the world's oceans were 25 meters higher. So to keep warming below 2 degrees will necessitate a global effort to drastically reduce emissions. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report said already that to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees would require having the global emissions by 2030. So this is perhaps the most memorable Earth Day observance that we will have. Now, as uh, Shoba mentioned, um, it's Earth Day on Wednesday. And um, it's memorable because the pandemic has brought the climate crisis into sharp focus. COVID happened because of human activities. Let's be clear about that. No, it is not a natural disaster. With massive ecosystem destruction due to the clearing of forest lands for monocrop plantation, you know, we use so much fertilizers, chemicals. But let's also be clear. Now, this is not to blame small farmers and farm workers. We know that agriculture has the highest share in global emissions, but it is fake news or misinformation to blame farmers. It is corporate agriculture that benefits from all of these things. COVID is just one virus, no, but it is a taste of things to come if climate justice is not achieved. Glaciers are melting, the permafrost, but already, you know, more than 500,000 people have died as a result of natural disasters between 1998 and 2007. As a result of extreme weather conditions, there are now 17.2 million climate migrants. So climate change is real. It is not science fiction. So I'd like to give you the first lesson that we have this afternoon. What did we learn in kindergarten? If things get rough, you know, we should hold hands and stick together, share and always play fair. Now, climate change is a global problem, but then again, isn't it that some are more responsible than the others for their causes, while the effects are felt more by poor people in poor countries? We know that most of humanity bears little responsibility for the climate breakdown. The lion's share of that responsibility instead falls variously on, number one, a handful of corporations. 100 companies are said to be responsible for 70% of all global CO2 emissions. Number two, there's a handful of industrialized countries with high levels of historic and per capita pollution, you know, such as the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, and Japan, who together have emitted 66% of all emissions, but they only have 25% or even less of the global population. Or perhaps we want to also look at a small percentage of this global population. Now, 10% are currently responsible for 50% of total emissions. Both the causes and the impacts of climate change can be seen along highly racialized, gendered, class-determined, and even caste-determined lines. Some governments have already declared climate emergencies, but what are they actually doing? The concern for the planet is being used to turn all the attention and energy away from what really causes the crisis. Now, this fixation on having more and producing more at any cost and towards dangerous distractions presented as quote-unquote solutions, you know, things like geoengineering, clean coal, carbon capture and storage, and many other things that we only watched in science fiction movies. Now, these are now being presented as solutions to climate change. Business as usual cannot continue. And also, we should not allow those who seek to make more business than usual, those who cash in on the climate crisis with their fancy and expensive techno fixes. So just for the record, we want equitable action and not just any climate action because that's another um, misinformation that's circulating. We have SDG goal number 13, which talks about climate action. 
But sadly or expectedly, the SDGs are generally off track. And there are so many reasons for this, no? funding or resourcing included, which is why the UN Secretary General has called to accelerate action and implementation because we only have 10 years to go till the SDG deadline. But really, for climate, the crisis is already upon us. Lesson number two, don't take things that aren't yours. Say sorry when you hurt somebody. Most importantly, clean up your mess. Now, climate change magnifies the injustices and inequalities that colonialism and the continuing reality of unfair trade deals and investment rules that bring in super profits for corporations, usually from the global north, and corrupt politicians from the global south. And the poor in these countries, in our countries, bear the brunt of the negative effects of these policies on their livelihoods and the environment. We have to tell the world leaders that even radical domestic action, you know, like for instance, even with 100% cuts in emissions by rich countries, this won't be enough to stop extreme climate breakdown because the global south is also expected to do more to transform our economies and production. But, you know, we want to do it. We want to do this, of course, but this cannot be done without massive finance, technology and capacity. Repaying the climate debt owed by the global north to the global south is necessary to avert the further breakdown of our planet's natural systems. Maybe some of you will ask, you know, how long I've been involved in climate diplomacy. Well, I've been involved in observing climate diplomacy for far too long. Um, if the COP26 would have pushed through, that would have been my 12th um, COP or conference of parties. No? So climate diplomacy negotiations have been ongoing for the last 25 years, long before many of you were probably even born. But I ask you now, have these negotiations brought us closer to having real solutions to save people and planet? Now, unfortunately, you know, climate denialism is happening. It's gaining stronghold even in the UN, such that in the negotiations, believe it or not, um, countries, negotiators are stepping in to defend science. So climate denialism is happening in our very midst. There is also the blurring of distinction and responsibilities between rich and poor countries. No, um, People say that one of the very foundations of the UN is the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. But now... Rich countries especially say that climate change is a global problem, so therefore everyone should pitch in. You know, even poor countries who have very little carbon footprint, who have even communities who have done the least to contribute to the climate crisis, it seems like um, you know, the fake news, the misinformation that climate change is an equalizer you know, that's being uh, peddled left and right, especially in the UN, just so rich countries can evade responsibility for paying up for all the climate mess that they've caused. And that brings me to the next point about uh, the nature of climate negotiations. No, It's about obstructionism. You know, rich countries, uh, businesses, they try to uh, lobby for their own agenda, uh, which is uh, to stall the negotiations. Uh, that is why 25 years down the line, um, governments are forever locked in endless negotiations. Or worst, they provide false solutions, no? as I've discussed earlier, that make more business opportunities than usual to cash in on the climate crisis. Lesson number three. I guess we all know this by now. No? We are all connected. Everything is connected to everything else. It's important to debunk the view that the coronavirus is a natural disaster. 
The scientists have long warned about how the destruction of biodiversity creates the conditions for new viruses and diseases. The pandemic reminds us that our current food system is unsafe and unjust and unsustainable because it involves massive ecosystem disruption, which causes, and, uh, which causes pandemics and new pathogens. Um, I'm, I suppose we've been uh, hearing and reading about this a lot these days. Scientists have also long warned that climate change will impact not just our environment, but also our health by increasing the rates of infectious diseases. 28 previously undiscovered virus groups have been recently identified in a melting glacier. So in recent years, researchers have pulled samples of smallpox, Spanish flu, bubonic plague, and even anthrax from throwing perma permafrost. These harmful pathogens could make their way into streams, rivers, and waterways as the ice caps melt, wreaking havoc on our immune systems that have no natural resistance to these ancient diseases. COVID outbreak is an indication that future may now be our reality. And that is perhaps the most compelling reason why the world has to get its act together, taking action on human-induced climate change now with even more sense of resolve. Already, losses and damages from extreme weather conditions are causing untold miseries for the poor across all continents in terms of lives, livelihoods, and cultural practices affected. So the pandemic now is a potentially explosive public health situation, especially for climate migrants who usually flee to evacuation centers or to other places of safety. Now, COVID-19 magnifies the inequalities that histories of colonialisms and the continuing legacy of neoliberal exploitation that is so deeply entrenched in our society. These are the reasons also why for the poor and marginalized who are already in the front lines of the climate crisis, the pandemic is the quote unquote perfect storm because they are the people vulnerable to flooding, drought, typhoons, and who do not have much options to live by in these times of social distancing and community lockdowns because they have mouths to feed and bills to pay or as in situation of migrants and refugees, they practically have no rights and have nowhere else to go. So the multiple vulnerabilities of poverty, homelessness, lack of social protection, exclusion, and other manifestations of inequality, plus exposure to the virus are a fatal combination. So this is my last lesson. We all learned in kindergarten that you need to flush it down. No? Um, let's keep fighting the good fight because we will not give up on our beautiful planet. But we have to realize and to make the others realize as well that the only thing that has ever reduced emissions is less economic production and overcoming this fixation with growth and extraction. No one can ever win, and we all end up losing if we do not flush down this system that puts corporate and individual profits and interests over the survival and development of people and planet. Capitalism, okay, let's name it already. Capitalism, with its twisted logic, brings about multiple contradictions that have been exposed by both the pandemic and the climate crisis. Now, what are these multiple contradictions? One is of socialized production, yet privatized gains. Number two, the primacy of growth fixated systems of extraction, production, distribution, and consumption that sacrifices the needs of the many and the well-being of the, the planet to the interests of a few. Another contradiction would be the unequal and exploitative economic and social structures that commodify nature and deeply embed inequality between and among countries and between women and men. So the challenge now is um, how to turn the shock of the pandemic crisis into this watershed moment 
that will put capitalism in the dustbin of history. Social movements in civil society have long rallied for systemic changes to solve the climate crisis. No, we've been saying, you know, this systemic change need to encompass modes of production and consumption practices to be compatible with the limits of the planet. We need changes uh, to the way we produce and consume such that the primary consideration now would be meeting people's needs and not the relentless pursuit of profit. This would entail progressive shifts of the world's economic, social, and political architectures away from fossil fuels and other harmful extractive industries and reorienting this towards systems that embody solidarity, regeneration, and equity. Now, there are already a lot of initiatives and proposals that articulate how such transitions to climate justice may happen. And they go by different labels. Uh, some call it just transitions. Some would call it a feminist Green New Deal, Buen Vivir or Living Well. Or for us in the region, we call it development justice. Now, many other labels that offer not just a holistic critique of why the dominant economic system does not work for people and planet, but also of the rationale and process for the comprehensive overhaul of the said system. So people say that the pandemic has ushered in the end of the new normal. But really, we should ask ourselves, what is normal in a world saddled by crisis upon crisis? No? So maybe the end of the new normal is an opportunity and an invitation to make another world possible. So these are some of the lessons that we all know, but maybe now is the time to look back at them and see the wisdom in kindergarten. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pepit. And uh, now I'm sure the... Our audience must be writing down their questions. You can ask, unmute yourself and ask the, any questions yourself, any clarifications, uh, or you may write it in the chat box. Uh, I think uh, that it has given us a lot of food for thought right now. And uh, we need to respond to that. There are many things, of course, I have always loved the way she explained things. So she took us back to kindergarten and taught us some very, very heavy lessons. Yes. So please, audience, please ask your questions, write in the chat box or ask yourself. I think some of them had sent some questions earlier also that to you, uh, but there's some questions, maybe they have all been addressed, but if they want some, some more, something more elaborate on a particular question which they had said they could they could ask now. So please go ahead. Let me check. Yes, wake up. Is it too hot? I know many of us don't have electricity in the house, but at least I'm sure you must be having a fan above you. Okay, now th there is some question. That it, are you able to read the question in the chat box or should I read it? Okay, okay. Um, Sartar Singh wants to know that he says that I understand that flushing it down seems like the most feasible solution, but you, could you please tell us how practical it is in such an industrialized world? Very relevant question. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's it's actually doable, no? And some already uh, have started this process of uh, degrowth, mm -hmm. and I think the pandemic now makes governments realize that in this highly globalized world, we cannot continue the way we do things. 
Now, for instance, now they're beginning to realize that massive extraction, uh, massive uh, pollution, uh, these are the effects of all of these centuries of uh, environmental destruction that we have been uh, doing. You know? And I think you know, people always try to look for the silver lining. So I don't think it's a silver lining, but I think this is a serious wake-up call. No, not just for uh, the government leaders, but also uh, so that um, multilateral institutions, um, uh, government officials, um, corporations even, no? they should realize that there are limits to the extractive and destructive industries and the production that they're doing. So I think... Um, the whole concept around uh, just transition is exactly this one. Now we try to shift away, move away from dirty pollutive industries, including dirty pollutive sources of energy, towards more uh, renewable and more environment friendly. Um, that is why in many countries, uh, governments are taking the lead in uh, shifting to 100% renewable energies. No? Um, while it is a good initiative towards a cleaner future, I think for many of us in the Global South, uh, the 100% RE is a really tall order. Now, because without democratizing access to 100% renewables, now, people, ordinary people, will also not uh, enjoy the bene whatever benefits of renewable energy because this would still be concentrated in the hands of corporations who want to make more profits. That is what I meant by cashing in on the climate crisis, not turning the crisis into a business opportunity so that those who have the patents, those who have the capital, those who have the investments, they can you know, market these as clean energy, as uh, renewable energy. So this is a serious wake-up call and that, um, you know, any alternative that does not seriously look at the question of democratization and access, um, that can only uh, be turned into another business opportunity, which is what we do not like. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rahul Sharma wants to know, that governments and people also want consumer goods, which make industries harm the environment. So how to resolve this? And is it too late? And how to resolve the problem? Maybe we can also hear about them. You know, do you think it's too late for us to shift? I think it's never too late. You know, we should not ignore uh, what science is telling us. And this is already a very painful sneak preview of what will happen to us if we do not make that shift. You know, um, I don't know how much we can endure. I don't know. Um, you know, if we can recover, uh, if we can survive, you know, surviving this crisis alone is already a big challenge in itself. Um, there are already lots of talk about recovering better. It's good, you know. Um, there's hopeful op optimism that we will recover and we need to recover better. We need to learn the painful lessons. But sometimes, you know, um, a lot of the decisions are far beyond the grasp of ordinary uh, citizens like us. Even that is true, even if that were true, then we should use whatever power we have as citizens, as voters, as uh, you know, um, members of organizations and even members of the academy. We should use whatever power we have in our hands to pressure governments and multilateral institutions that recovering better does not mean you know we should adopt the we're back in business approach because this is the very approach that brought us to this very big mess in the first place i don't know if that made sense no i'm, I'm rambling right now <laughs> help me no you're not uh, before uh, I go on to the next question, I would just like to ask the, tell the audience, if you want to ask the question yourself, maybe you just unmute yourself and let us hear your voice also. 
Jeevan uh, Joseph has put up a question. Jeevan, would you like to ask yourself, please? Uh, that would be better. Just unmute yourself and ask. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity, ma'am. So my first question was, uh, is the ecological damage that is created by global warming becoming a threat to more and more different species of animals? That's my first question. And the second think, one is... Uh, uh, Jivan, I think let uh, Tetat answer the first yes, question yes, and then you can ask the second one. Yes. Okay. Or maybe we can hear both questions okay, okay, and then okay, I'll just okay, try. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, sorry. Yes, Jivan, please go on, continue. Okay, okay, okay. And the second question is, can we treat our industrial effluents better to create a cleaner environment? And also, which are the industries that create the most harm in terms of effluents and all? Thank you. Um, big questions, no? <laughs> Let's try to help each other. Um, I think with, with, with climate change, with the climate crisis, it's not just a question of ecological damage, no? but this is already an existential threat. We know that uh, science has to told us that we have already breached so many of the uh, planetary boundaries. No? Um, and it's only a matter of... Uh, a few years where we will already reach the point of no return. Now, I think that several years is also giving a sense of complacency to many of our policymakers. If they say that we have 10 years to go before the point of no return, that makes them complacent that they can still stall, they can still delay action. No, we don't have 10 years before we reach the point of no return because the climate crisis is already here upon us. No, it's not just creating a lot of damages and threats to animal species, but we're talking here about the very life of our planet and all the inhabitants in this planet. So it's not just uh, to animal life, to plant life, but the very life of our planet is already under threat. Now, if we do not uh, pull the brakes and try to see, you know, try to reverse, uh, there's no turning back anymore. The, the havoc that this um, pandemic is causing us is just going to be a very small sneak preview of things to come. Um, under when we reach that point of no return. So as I've mentioned earlier, um, agriculture has always been blamed for causing the most emissions. Um, but we have to nuance that. It's not the agriculture that our small farmers do, but it is corporate agricultural pro practices that bring so much emissions. In terms of which industries, I think the most destructive industries are those that extract from earth, you know, mining. Um, when we flatten the lands in order to um, convert agricultural, uh, agricultural lands to cash crops, I think you can relate because uh, that is already a reality for many of us in the Global South. Now, our agricultural lands are converted so that we can export to rich countries. Now, even this so-called alternative of um, agrofuels, biofuels, it's being promoted as an alternative but whenever I speak to a northern audience, I always tell them, you know, your alternative so that you can still feel good about, you know, continuing to use your biofuel powered cars, uh, etc. It's killing our people because our lands are being cleared to from producing food for our people to producing cash crops, agrofuels so that we can export it. 
And before that happens, you know, our people, indigenous communities especially, are also driven away from their lands, you know, with the use of police and military force. They are not uh, allowed to, to plant and to, to go about their livelihoods because these lands are now dedicated for producing export crops. So, you know, we have to uh, debunk all of these myths, all of these uh, fake news that uh, ultimately put the blame on the people who are the best stewards of our environment. And these are uh, people who have caused the least damage but are now paying the uh, biggest price for all of the impacts of the climate crisis. Right, right. Uh, uh, we have a comment and question from Saida Deep. Uh, thanks for your insightful talk. Uh, many years ago in our work, we found malaria outbreak can be predicted if we watch climate events or weather changes. So we knew climate is impacting disease outbreaks. Do you think health, trade, and environment ministry work? Do, do you think health, trade, and environment ministry work together? We do not want trade that ruins environment or health. Yes. Well. Isn't that how governments are supposed to work in the first place, no? Um, um, it should be coordinated. But it's not just government agencies uh, trying to get their acts together, but it's also their whole approach in development work. Um, it's no longer valid that uh, development is undertaken by government agencies alone. But increasingly, we have proven that development works if there is the broadest ownership of the people around any agenda. So that means development should be uh, reconceptualized. No, it's not government bringing development to its people or um, private sector bringing development to the people, but it's more like, how do we now make development everybody's agenda? And so um, I think the most successful development programs are those that have the support and the ownership of the people. And so I think we should also try to challenge ourselves into how we think about uh, the best way to approach development. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anjali Sunil wants to ask a question. Uh, uh, I can see her hand raised. Anjali? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, hi ma'am. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yes. Uh, so, my, so my question was regarding what you answered previously regarding the biofuels. So you said that it's harm. Also, we can see seen as an alternative to fossil fuels that is also causing harm to our environment. So don't you think at the end of the day, this is a trade-off? I mean, biofuels is maybe perhaps can be a better alternative to fossil fuels. And if you feel it's not, then what do you think should be an ideal alternative to this uh, problem? Thank you. I think it would be best for us if we try to uh, no one's a lot of things, no? Um, I think now with the pandemic, um, we are being challenged to go back to lessons we learned in kindergarten. That's why I've made my presentation in that way, no? What is important for us? Food, health, uh, homes, um, you know, the basics. We realize it really takes so little for us to, uh, to be able to live. But what has happened is because of um, industrialization, technology, etc., you know, the kind of economic system that we have right now focuses so much on uh, consumerist ideals. For instance, um, you are well off 
which means what would be the standards of you being well off? You have a nice house, you have a nice car, you're able to study in, you know, prestigious universities abroad, you have a high paying job. These are the metrics by which we used to uh, measure, you know, uh, if one is well off. But now it's being challenged. Being well off is being challenged by the concept of well being. You know, it's it, there's a difference. Uh, if you're well off, you are you have all of these possessions. If you, uh, you know, as opposed to well being, which is a totally different conception. So I think to answer your question, it's not always a trade off. Because if it's if we look at things as a trade-off, then we always try to go for the lowest common denominator. Now, which is I think a very problematic um, framework if you want to consider um, how to how to make sure that um, people. Uh, realize their full potentials as human beings, no? Because if we only look at the metrics of being well off, then <clears throat> it's a totally capitalist framework of uh, having more, consuming more, being more, which comes at the expense of the environment, which comes at the expense of other people. You know, this is the capitalist logic that that is at work, which is why. Um, how do we explain uh, the uh, people running wild uh, in a mad rush to empty the supermarket shelves, including toilet paper? You know, why on earth would you need tons and tons of toilet paper? Our ancestors did not have toilet paper before, and yet they lived. <laughs> you know, just go back to basics. Uh, you don't need so much toilet paper. You don't need so much of everything. No, and for the biofuels, I think it's very important for us to realize that the trade-off here is food security for our people, food sovereignty for our people. And what is the trade-off? So that uh, corporations in the north can continue producing um, hybrid cars so that their people can buy these cars and continue their lifestyles, etc., etc., etc. So, you know, these are very difficult decisions that um, we have to look at the bigger picture, you know. Is this the kind of society that uh, I want to go back to? Is this the kind of normal that I want to go back to after the pandemic? You know, it forces us to think outside the box. And I think it's a, this is one good thing that's coming out from this crisis. It forces us to think outside the box that the normal is really a situation of multiple crises that doesn't work for people. It doesn't work for planet. Thank you. Nivedita wants to ask a question. Nivedita, what's your question? Please ask. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, so, ma'am, I think you just said that um, as a solution, human beings should go back to their basic needs instead of like focusing on their larger needs. Uh, but I feel like if all human beings have to go back to the basic, most basic of their needs, it would take more than 10 years. And if I'm not wrong, you just mentioned before that climate change is a very current crisis and we don't have that much of time. Like we can't wait for 10 years. So how would you address this problem? I mean, how would you suggest we address this? Thank you. You're making me think harder. Huh? <laughs> but I think it's good. Now we're having a real conversation here. Um, how do I put it? Going back to basics does not mean going back to primitive times. Now, I don't think we can go back to primitive times because there's already been so much advancement in technology, in uh, you know the way we, we interact with, with each other. So by going back to basics, I think what we need to really find deep in our hearts you know, is how do we reclaim the 
basic values of humanity. You know that it's it's for it's it's for the common good. We need to think beyond ourselves. No, and I think it's very important now that we try to reflect on what are the uh, values that uh, would help us through this crisis. For instance, um, we say that it's not actually social distancing that would save us from the crisis, but social solidarity. No, we need to look after each other. We need to take care of each other because no matter how many gallons of alcohol you have, no matter how many boxes of um, N95 masks you have, if your neighbor is, in, is infected, then you know there's a very high chance that you would also be infected. Um, no matter how much we stock up on this on food, this is likely to run out if you know um, we are not able to support our farmers, uh, we're not able to support our workers in order to uh, to go outside and, and do their job, you know, to plant and work, etc. And how do we do that? If we, as civil society, if we, as students, if we, you know, everyone can now um, let their voices be heard. Uh, in terms of uh, our policymakers, you know, in the Philippines, um, we have a very strong tradition of social movements here. And uh, now that we are on the lockdown, we are already entering our second month of lockdown. And um, today, um, the president will uh, declare, you know, martial rule in the country, which means it's not only that we are prohibited from uh, going outside. It's really the military will enforce uh, such lockdown. You know? And um, so how do you go about your activism? How do you pressure government to deliver? So we've resorted to online tools. You know, we've been complaining. We've been engaging in social media. Uh, we've been calling for mass testing because it's only now that our government is conducting mass testing, but we're already in a lockdown for more than one month. Uh, we've already uh, um, campaigned uh, for, you know, some emergency relief, especially for the poor people who are affected. If we did not make noise around this, even, you know, through social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc., um, policymakers will get off the hook so easily. You know, and I think now we are also being challenged to be creative. How do we now um, uh, let our voices be heard so that, um, you know, maybe some government officials are well-meaning, but they just don't know how to do it? Civil society, students, academia, we have lots of time to think about this thing. So maybe, you know, our helpful suggestions should get through them. I've always said that civil society, <clears throat> everyone, citizens, we have three fundamental um, responsibilities in societies that we live in. Number one, we should expose. You know, expose uh, any wrongdoings, any injustice that happens. Number two, we should oppose. Of course, if there is uh, injustice, if there is exploitation, we should oppose it. But we also have a third responsibility. We should propose. We should not just be criticizing and criticizing, but we should also be putting forward viable alternatives that the policymakers um, can learn from. Now, the proposal can take the form, can take on many forms, no? You do active campaigning, you know, make a lot of noise around it, blah, 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 blah. But you can also do, you know, specific policy interventions, policy proposals that can be done. And of course, one thing that we've learned in all these years of um, um, civil society work is that um, your our policy suggestions are considered or heard more loudly if there is social movement campaigning behind us. 
So these two things should work hand in hand, no? Um, proposing, exposing, opposing, you know, these are things that we should all consider uh, as one part of the whole package. Right, you so right, right. Uh, now, before I ask Isha to ask her question, I can see her hand raised. Uh, just uh, one last time, I'm asking if there are any more questions. Uh, you please raise your hand or write in the chat box because already we have overshot the time. Sorry for that, uh, Tete. But now Isha can ask her question. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, very audible. Yeah, uh, I'd like to know that uh, one of the SDGs mentioned about economic growth, and you mentioned that for climate justice to occur, we need to cut down on our incessant need to have higher production and consumption. So are these two goals in any way counterintuitive to each other? That's a very good point that you made, no? Because it's an SDG goal, sustained economic growth. Uh, but there's also another, uh, you know, it's not it's not sustained economic growth, full stop, you know. But it's also sustained economic growth, ensure decent work, livelihoods, uh, eradicate inequality. So the SDGs are not to be taken um, as one. You know, they're, they're part of the whole package. No goal met until all goals met. You know, that's one thing I've learned in all these years of um, observing the process. So I think uh, you raise a valid point about still the need to continue economic growth. Economic activities should continue. That's for sure. But what needs to uh, be discontinued is the very privatized nature of um, distributing the fruits of economic growth, now, which is one fundamental um, contradiction with capitalism. There's so much econom uh, economic activity, economic production, but the gains of these are concentrated in the hands of a few, you know, the 1% in many of our societies. I think uh, the points I've been raising earlier about the need to democratize, the need for people to um, access and enjoy the fruits of their labor, that points to the need to eradicate inequality. You know, uh, why is there a 99%, 1% discourse still? You don't just make things um, equitable by trying to, you know, make the pie larger so that people can hope to find uh, or can hope to have a bigger slice of the pie. No, you make the pie larger and uh, try to make sure that everyone gets the same slice of that pie. No, not, you know, not a bigger slice for some people and the rest will share teeny tiny pieces of that same pie. So that's how you correct inequality. But that is not yet happening. And I think that's what we should be working on. Seriously. Yes. And some will not get any, any part of the pie. Many will not get any part of the pie. So you're very right. That economic growth has to be shared equally by everyone. Right. Uh, Shruti Ayer wants to ask a question. Shruti, please unmute yourself and ask. Yes, Shruti. Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, very audible. Okay. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, the talk was really good. My question is somewhat related to the previous question. So, um, so the thing is that a major, uh, most of the world is still in a developing phase. And if we were, if the developing world were to imitate the countries which have reached a sort of uh, green utopia like that of Sweden, then we still have a long way to go. I mean, these developing countries are very dependent on the developed countries, given that our economy is bec becoming more and more globalized. And this dependency is not just between countries, it's also to a lot of um, 
dirty resources as i mean i don't know how else to put it with a lot of, that generates a lot of ca- carbon so my basic question is just tying a loop on the entire thing is if we were to become something like the scandinavian countries who are in some sort of a green utopia we have we need more money to get there as in it's expensive to even reach that point so um, how and the in between of actually investing and getting to that point is a very gray gray area and as somebody who is just stepping into the economy as somebody who's going to start working um i do not know how it's going to fit into the entire process like from where are we going to get the investments to bring about these green resources to work with in the first place Okay, very uh, big question. Maybe we need another session. No? Um, I think uh, it's important for us to recognize, to realize that these Scandinavian countries, the North, they reached their level of development because of history of colonialism. They plundered our countries, you know, like for the Philippines, we were for 300 years a colony of Spain. <clears throat> and then after that, <clears throat> the Japanese, the Americans, you know, so for many of our, uh, for many of the developing countries, colonialism is a legacy, but it is not just a legacy because we have the continuing reality of unfair trade deals that continue to extract resources from our countries so that we can process this into light manufactured goods. And then the heavier stuff, the more industrialized uh, stuff uh, happens in, in, the northern, in the northern countries. For many of our countries, the only real value added that we bring to the production is natural resources and our labor, which has been made so cheap. That's why they put all of their investments, labor-intensive investments in our countries because wages have been made so low as one incentive for foreign investments to come to our countries. Now, so our governments are complicit in all of these things that are happening because in the mad rush to bring about foreign investments in our countries, they want to make sure that you know um, our country is attractive to foreign investors and cheap labor is one policy that makes it uh, that makes it happen. So I don't think we would want to imitate that kind of model, no, where you have to invade and uh, colonialize, uh, colonize other countries. And I don't think it's possible uh, at this stage, even though there are a lot of um, colonialism still going on. But we know we do need to. Uh, to take a stand against unfair trade deals that continue to extract our resources, that continue um, to make us get the raw end of the deal. You know, that's that's it, basically. We need for Thank our governments... I'm so sorry to interrupt, but mm-hmm. doesn't that sort of add into the loop of the entire thing? Like, already the developing countries, as you said, are being exploited for the little amount of development that they do face. So now how do... And we definitely need help in terms of getting um, there in... Like, we need help even to get to the sustainable development part of it and have green resources. So if we are bullied on this end of dirty resources, how are we not going to get bullied for that end of good resources? Yeah, um, I don't have the answers to all of your questions. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a conundrum, no? Because unless and until... Sorry. Unless and until we... um, develop domestic capacity um, to develop our resources, to, to develop our industrial sector, then we would forever be dependent on the, on the industrialized countries. No? Because, um, but then again, um, I'd like to clarify your point about we need their help. No? Because um, we're part of the UN system and in the UN there is a recognition that um, you know the, the fundamental principle of the UN is that of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities. So in recognition, this is in recognition 
that the history of colonialisms um, enabled the rich countries to develop as such. And it is also a reason why developing countries like ours are in such a sorry state. So, you know, in the spirit of international cooperation, um, all member states of the United Nations in principle, uh, subscribe to this idea of common but differentiated responsibilities, which is fine, you know, as a bedrock of um, multilateralism. But you know, it's 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 better in paper than than actually realized because in reality, um, whatever help we get uh, in terms of investments, it always comes back as more beneficial to the countries, to the corporations that put in the investments in the first place. Um, foreign aid is actually more beneficial to the donor country than to the recipient country. You know, because of the technical contracts, we make sure that we hire their consultants, etc. And so many strings attached to whatever help that the rich countries give us. So I think what would be important is for us to be able to you know, create that momentum so that the governments listen to us. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we create that momentum. No? I already gave you some hints earlier. Um, but we should make them listen to us. Or if they still don't listen to us, then, you know, uh, there are many different forms and arenas of struggles. Uh, I think we all know, no, um, in India, in the Philippines, in many other places in the world, um, there is um, civil war happening. There are wars for national liberation happening, you know. So people take up arms. People resort to different forms of struggle to defend their livelihoods, to defend their lives. So that is why it's a very... Um, it's a very difficult situation, no? Um, but we need to be able for governments to listen to us, whatever it takes, no? So that uh, they make sure that resources are properly allocated <clears throat> to reach the the ones who need it the most. Um, for instance, um, a lot of our national budget goes for military expenditures. Mm -hmm. That is so unproductive <laughs> and it could be better used, you know, for more, uh, for more productive activities like um, spurring uh, economic growth, economic activity, especially now in the time of the pandemic, pandemic where um, consumption is really low because everything stopped, no? Mm -hmm. um, instead of using continuing to use the budget to fund military expenditures to fight, to fight wars etc cetera, etc cetera. use that money to uh, to create stimulus packages for people who are most affected by the crisis use that money uh, for health and emergency purposes no things that could be used to better uh, rechannel those much needed resources where it is most needed Thank you. Uh, that is, with your permission, just one last question we will take. I know we have overshot the time. Uh, Sartaj wants to ask a question. Yes, Sartaj. Um, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. So just a quick question, although I initially thought of a longer question. But so uh, there's been this research of that if a country's per capita GDP goes above around $6,000 or so, the people actually start caring about the environment. So uh, this seem like uh, like this, this seems plausible because if a person whose family doesn't have a lot of money, he has to eat like let's consider the poorer strata. So they would burn firewood and cook the fuel, which is obviously not efficient or it's very bad for the environment, right? Now, uh, how important is like economic dwell development for that? And like uh, the, uh, since the country is also developing such countries which have low per capita GDPs. Uh, so they can't put R&D into alternative sources of energy. Like you said that many of the Western countries in the last questions have, you know, uh, gone farther ahead. Uh, so uh, obviously they can't put so much R&D into the alternative sources of energy, but uh, like the ones which are developing. Now, 
also there's this another question sideline that how to separate the climate change movement from the identity politics like left bias right bias politics in the world yeah mm. i don't know <laughs> um i think you raised very valid points no but um i don't know if uh, you know increasing of course we already talked about uh, making sure that everyone gets an equal share of the pie i don't know if that uh, increasing um, per capita incomes would have a direct correlation to you know greater um receptiveness for more environment friendly practices i'm not sure if there's already been studies around around those things but i think uh maybe let's challenge ourselves to go beyond gdp as a metric of a uh, of a uh, being well off now for instance i know that um in bhutan they have this um gross uh what's it gross happiness index i think uh, uh new zealand is also rethinking you know it's a uh, it's metrics for um well-being so you know there are a lot of things that gnp gdp can measure but it also doesn't measure a lot of things um so now maybe those conventional economic indicators while they still serve some purpose um uh, it is not for the purpose of uh, the transformations that we want to see happening now if uh, we still try to live by those indices then maybe um that wouldn't be um comparable or reflective of the changes that we also want to happen because that those indicators were formulated under a a capitalist system so to speak no so the metrics of economic growth um i don't know if that answered your question but i probably gave you another problem not to think about <laughs> um um climate yeah. change yeah. is it's political definitely it's political because there are those who deny it and there are those who try to sound off the urgency of of the climate crisis um it's very political because i don't think um lifestyle changes alone would be enough to solve the climate crisis no we need systemic changes in the way societies are organized in the way societies uh produce things that they need in order to survive um these are highly political decisions and highly political discussions that need to be taken into account um but there are also those who say that um you know the the climate crisis um goes beyond individual lifestyle choices it, it but it's very much uh, about the politics and the economics of things now it's ultimately political economy that uh, would define you know the the responses we might have on the on the problem and the the solutions that we might have going forward thank you Uh, and i Thank just you. want we just wanted to say one thing there tetet and to sartaj also from my very very simple understanding that person who's burning the firewood i think the contribution to uh, carbon footprints or to uh, uh, vitiating the at, at, uh, climate is far far too less than what we are contributing to those who are those whose income is much higher than that person's not, we are not using firewood but we are using other things which are really polluting that must be much more than that that is my one of my understandings so what do you say to that <laughs> yes <laughs> i agree totally <laughs> okay so many thanks for a really very stimulating discussion today and uh, goodbye to our listeners until we meet again on wednesday that is day after tomorrow at 2 pm and we will be interacting with ila gandhi who is a noted peace activist 
and she also happens to be the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, who is revered in our country as the father of the nation. So goodbye till then. And again, very many thanks to Tetet for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. See you in better days. Yes, yes. Hopefully, yes. Tomorrow will be a better day and another day. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>